Good afternoon, welcome to Hardware is Hard. My name is Dave Park from Obtainium Retro, and uh, we're just a small company that does uh, PCB assembly for open hardware projects. And uh, I've put together a panel today of people who design or work with hardware that know the experience of making new expansions for old hardware, or just know about old hardware and the problems with old hardware. And I would like you all to just introduce yourselves one at a time. Oh, I see I'm on the hut. Okay. Uh, my name is June. I'm actually uh, from Nibbles and Bytes. Um, the thing that's sort of behind the scenes is I'm an embedded software engineer, um, so I like tinkering with all kinds of weird hardware. Um, my current open source project, and I'm probably going to farm out to you at some point, um, is the PS2 to Flash Floppy adapter, which will do 2.88 meg signaling to a PS2 host controller. And that's all a whole bunch of gobbledygook. Probably even most of you don't even know about because it's really niche. So, <laughs> yeah. anyway. Hi everyone, uh, Kevin Williams of techselect.com. I've uh, been building parts for vintage computers now for, I guess, seven or eight years. Uh, we also designed the motherboard for the Commander X16, and uh, I work on a lot of different things across the board in electronics, uh, not just vintage stuff. I also work on new things as well sometimes, so that's kind of what we do. Hello, I'm uh, Carlos Santiago. I go by Guru Santiago. My company is Electronics is Fun. I develop little boards that plug into retro computers such as the Guru modem, the C64 net, and the Guru net. And I have a new product called the Guru C64 net that gives you some storage capability and Wi-Fi for the Commodore computers. Um, I've been in the industry working on computer hardware and software for over 40 years. and I develop my own small PCBs and designs at home. I work during the day for AMD. Uh, Adrian Black. I do YouTube. <laughs> and uh, I don't have any education in hardware, but I certainly fix a lot of old computers. So I get to see other people's hardware designs and, and fix them. Yeah, <laughs> I fix my fair share of Tandys. And um, yeah, I, I certainly have a lot of experience in, in fixing stuff, but I've also, and, and I think Dave will talk about this, is I've designed a few PCBs of my own as well. Now that those tools are freely available and you and making this easy. So yeah, I have a little bit of experience, but generally I've sort of picked up as I've gone along and figured out how to fix this old junk. <laughs> Sorry, some, some people don't get offended by that, but. Uh, <laughs> so I'm uh, Paul Schreiber, formerly of uh, Tandy Electronics R&D. Um, I was uh, Steve Leiniger's technician, so I wire up the Model 1. I didn't have enough sense to stop there, so I worked at Tandy off and on as either a uh, co-op, which is a paid intern, or as an uh, engineer on staff from early 1979 through when the a AST people bought us. Uh, I'm kind of unique. I'm the only hardware engineer that worked on both analog and digital. So I worked on both consumer electronic sides, car stereos. How many people here knew that Alpine car stereos was built by Tandy? Pioneer car stereos, blau punked car stereos were all built by Tandy Electronics. And so I got free Mercedes out of it. No, I didn't. <laughs> and so... Um, that's been my experience. Also worked at Data Journal on the Eclipse uh, computer. Um, I'm not in the soul of machines, so don't even look. And uh, since then, I've worked at many different companies. And my hobby has always been electronic music. For those of you who know what a Tandy MG1 is, there's actually one out there in Tandy Showcase. Uh, I was the designer of the Tandy MG1 Moog synthesizer, and I have my own company called Synthesis Technology, which oddly enough does music synthesizers. Okay, so I do have an ask. This is being made into a video, and if you have a question for us, because you will be able to ask questions, there is a microphone right here, so please go to the microphone or you will not be heard in the video. Okay? And there are more people going to see the video than are here in person, so it's really important that they can hear the question. So, one of the things that we've been struggling with as hardware developers recently is. Um, the quality and availability of components. Um, the 5 volt era is over. The 3.3 volt era is coming to an end. And interfacing modern components to 
computers is getting harder and harder. And so I was just going to open it up to the panel, whoever wants to, to raise that and start with that and just take it off and uh, see what your experiences are with the challenges of using modern components. Maybe Carlos? Well, for example, let's say you have a system that's now 3.3 volt based and it's got an I2C interface. I2C traditionally ran signals at 5 volts, but most of the hardware today is 3.3 volts. So um, it's much safer to um, to put some circuit in between your, your I2C device and the system than to just put a, a resistor to limit the current. So normally you can use a a FET transistor in the circuit and that will allow you to translate the 5 volt signals down to 3.3 volts and vice versa. So that's one example. Additionally there are memories that now run at lower voltages uh, but you still have processors like the Z80, the 6502 and the 6809 that run at 5.5 volts so you can use level translators on the bus to get you down to a 3.3 volt and talk to those lower voltage memories to make things a lot easier for you. But that isn't the whole story, is it? Because the, the new components with the lower voltages, um, they switch from a logical zero to a logical one and back much more quickly than the older components. And when you connect them to a 40-year-old PCB that's normally two-layer, normally has a very poor ground and power design, um, it creates so much noise in the board. It's so problematic that you actually sometimes try and find slower components on purpose. And uh, I imagine that's been a bit of a problem for the Commander X16. Yeah, I mean, the Commander, you know, we could have actually run it at 3.3 volts. And I decided early on that we would try to keep compatibility with 5 volt stuff just because I thought people would try to integrate older hardware back into it. But as time has gone on, just kind of looking at it, I think 3.3 would have probably been easier because I think nearly every card that I've designed so far, I've had to level shift mm -hmm. uh, at some level or another. Uh, yeah, the timing certainly can be an issue. And yeah. there are times when you're inserting a delay or, you know, stretching a clock cycle in some way. And it gets challenging. Uh, you get very friendly with a logic analyzer and oscilloscope for sure. We get very friendly with yes. the logic analyzers. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, from a repair perspective, obviously I'm working with stuff that was designed in the 80s for TTL logic levels and even all this stuff, even when you level shift it, it's running at CMOS logic levels now, even though it's five volts, you know, at zero, the thresholds are different. And some systems like Commodore 64s are very sensitive to the thresholds, just the way the design was, it was on the edge in a lot of ways. And just using like HC parts, may work sometimes like 74 hc but a lot of times i'm like you do not put those on the boards and luckily there's availability of like you know some of the logic families are compatible like kevin and i have talked about this a lot but you can run into all sorts of issues and even like the chip testers these people are making modern chip testers they run at cmos levels because everything does now and you put a ttl chip in there and it gives you tons of false readings because of those thresholds. It's funny you mention that because I just started to kind of realize recently that there's actually a whole series of LVC chips, which is a low voltage, uh, it's usually 3.3 volt, 1.8 volt, but there's a 1G and 2G series, which they'll actually operate at 5 volts, 3.3 volts, 1.8 volt. So while a lot of things seem to be moving away from 5 volt, there are new components coming out right now, which you know are built to support 5 volt as well. So I think that there's an awareness from manufacturers that there's you know still some of us out here needing 5 volts for some reason or another. So it doesn't help that sometimes there'll be like a, a 741 gate chip and then a, a few months later you'll buy another one and the inside's different yeah. and the read the data sheets the always the process is data different and the part number is almost identical and the behavior is just completely different and it breaks everything. Or it's a rebadged part that you got from China that isn't what it says it is. <laughs> oh, I, 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 want we, to, I want to add something here that we, we've kind of not even mentioned and that is that um, all of these designs uh, are only as good as the, the board layout that you have. And so it's so critical that you take that into account when you're developing a new board right there are many things that that at, at face value look simple but they're not so whenever you design a board you need to understand how current flows in the board um, how to reduce noise how to decouple components all these little details all add together to 
bring you a robust design. If you miss any of those, you, what you might have is a design that's sensitive to temperature or voltage, or over time it may degrade. So it's very important to get to the point where you do a good clean board design to ensure that at least from that point, then you can look at the type of technology you use in your design to reduce noise and things of that nature. Or you end up with jail bars. So the, not, not a well-known thing. Bill's not here to defend yeah, himself. Yeah, I know. He's not here to defend himself. But like, oh, th that was actually one of the problems with the 128 wedge um, is the jail bars were actually because uh, he was sending a coaxial signal without having a proper ground plane. And so he was picking up noise from the address and data buses nearby. And so that's why you got all those jail bars coming across on the 40-column the screen. And in a respin of the, the PCB that was done uh, for the NEO 128 project, um, they fixed that by adding ground planes around the thing, and it eliminated a lot of the, the jail bar noise. Yeah, just as an example, one of the, th the techniques that I tend to use is um, I try to do all my designs in two-layer, but two-layer doesn't allow for easy uh, grounding and, and supply of power. So I develop my boards in such a way where the spacing of all my traces are far enough so that I can do a flood fill and ensure that all of my ground and power connections are being made. And so it effectively gives you some of the properties of a four layer board, but in a two layer design. Um, in a lot of cases, if you don't follow that technique and you run just single traces around the board to get power and ground, you'll create what's known as loops and they tend to pick up noise and create noise in the circuits and you reduce your noise margin in your design. So it's very important to be aware of these things when you uh, create new designs so that later you don't have to try to debug the problem on a functioning board and that, that's intermittent. Yeah, um, I grew up in the uh, Tandy world where if you said four layer board, you were escorted to the parking lot. <laughs> and if, if you said double sided board, you had to sit on John Roach's couch for a whole day and John Roach time out. Because what happens is we have a, if we're doing designs today, you know, we're going to JLC PCB or PCB way or someplace like that. Maybe if you're desperate, you go to advanced circuits or something. But the price is so ridiculously low that people like me can't even wrap our head around it. Okay. And I think a lot of people would really, not, not to pick on you, but just go four layer. That's one All of right. my rules. It's just, yeah. you Each go to four-layer. Layer. There's absolutely no reason not to go to four-layer, except your free Eagle Cad wouldn't let you, okay? So just just please, <laughs> please go to KiCad 8. It's okay. It'll import your Eagle stuff. Your, your schematics won't look like they're for Christmas because they're green and red, okay? Mm -hmm. Unless you happen to like that. But my point is, there's, when, when, you know, we're old, let's face it, we're in our 60s. We grew up where PC boards, or 70s maybe, I don't know. But we grew up where the PC board was the major cost of anything. Okay. When I, when I did uh, the Color Computer 1 Rev F board, which is outlined in Boise Petrie's book, about what I did was I improved the grounding around the video circuitry, which killed the chroma burst leak, which killed clowns and balloons, and they made me put the leak back in. And so, as someone with an MSWE, I'm a registered professional engineer in the state of Texas. I was the only PE in Tandy Corporation to sit there and have Bernie Appel and John Roach and John Roach says, boy, you got to put that noise back in there. <laughs> a, point, a point to you be know, made there know, is that... I'm just like, but, 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 but. And, you know, Mark Siegel, who may be in the audience, but I talked to him. He, he's like, he, he was a Radio Shack engineering. He's the guy that flunked me, and he wrote incompatible software. That was the fault. And I said, give me Steve Bajoric's phone number. I'm going to give him a call because that's in a legal mode. He goes, well, yes, but it's used in all these games, and we have to put the noise back in. 
Okay, but I'm telling you right now, part of doing retro stuff, I'll give a little quick speech, is that you reach a point where you have to stop being retro. I want to do a visual. You have, on one hand, you say, I'm, it's like a meter, an analog meter if you're really old. I'm completely <laughs> retro up here to, let's stick it all on FPGA, okay? Versus, I want... Other hand. Hey. It's like, I want to be true to the hardware. I want to make it as true as I can to the customer is, will it please work? <laughs> okay? I mean, I appreciate the effort that went into it. But at the end of the day, think about, it's got to work. All right? And in a lot of cases, we mentally try to have my job in the 80s at Radio Shack where, you know, if you were five cents over, over budget, Bernie Appel set your couch on fire, okay? And so you're not really restrained by that. Yes, you want to keep it in line, okay? But don't sit there at Mouser and do sort by price and automatically go to the top of the page and go, I want that one. <laughs> You do it. I know you do it. I've seen you do it. <laughs> All right? So just be aware of when you do retro designs, draw a line somewhere that says, okay, I'm going to go as good as I can, but at this point, I'll spend a dollar and add some level shifters. Right? right? I, I worked for a company that was so cost conscious that we looked at resistors and said, is this resistor really needed in this circuit? I right? worked for and Blackberry. We had a sign that said, every penny is a Ferrari. Yeah, this was, this was a, this was a 0 0.002 cent part. And we were asked to make sure we needed them. So every resistor is a You're Toyota hired camera. at Radio Shack. He has a job now at Radio Shack. Because what happens is it's scaled up. When I was at BlackBerry, our opening order from Verizon for a typical phone was 1.9 million phones. In a, in a BlackBerry phone or an Apple phone, I'll do a quick thing. How many capacitors are in a cell phone? Anybody? Three. 300, that's a good guess, but it's wrong. 500. Nope. nope. About 1,100 capacitors in a cell phone. Wow. 1,100. That's excessive. And so if you build 1,100 times 1 1.9 million phones, and we're running 11 different models in parallel, okay, that's why you have to make it. But when we're doing this kind of retro stuff, especially if we're doing it for ourselves or a limited audience of a few hundred or maybe in a few thousand, all I suggest is it's okay to spend a dollar on level shifters rather than trying to find a five volt EEPROM, okay, from Raymond Jet's storage unit or something that will work. I hope he's not in here. But anyway, that's my point. <laughs> well, and, you know, try not to count pennies based on what the people back then had to do. Commodore, Amiga, Tandy, everything was horribly expensive that today is dirt cheap. And it's hard for people like us to mentally even get over the fact that we can get... Uh, my last PC board at JLCPC was... A six layer board about four inches squares I got five of them delivered in four days for thirty two dollars that's amazing you okay. couldn't get one board like that back in the day it would be three four hundred dollars for one that's board. right yeah. and it would take you two weeks unless you paid the premium and then be a thousand dollars so the important takeaway here folks is going four layer is really cheap insurance it simplifies your entire design process. It lets you have to not worry about so many things. I mean, you should still worry about those things, but you don't have to. And what what we're getting from this story is that when you design a board, there's a, there's a range of function from no <laughs> to the perfect board that's going to pass every test and it's going to be, you know, the FCC is going to frame it. And... <laughs> There's a lot of um, open hardware projects that are developed like software where, oh, it works. I don't need to do any work on this. I need to go on to the next thing. And it's just working. 
But the thing that we forget is that we are plugging these into 40 and 45 year old computers that are not designed to the same standards, that are all in various modes of failure, that are not visible, and we have no way of predicting how this board will react when it's plugged into any individual system. And so it's a struggle for us as designers to make sure we cover most of that common ground and try and make our devices as reliable and consistent as possible. So um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? I mean, certainly I've, I've designed several sound cards and one of the struggles that I've run into is you never know what the power supply is going to be in the target system. So I attempt some level of filtering, but there's only really so much you can practically do before you add a lot of cost for something that you're not even certain is going to be a problem. But, you know, every now and then I'll get a call and, you know, somebody's like, oh, I, you know, I'm getting this terrible sound and I'll look and have them check their 12 volt line and it's just going, bloop, 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 you know, so. One of the things I do uh, as a standard thing is I see a range of the machines that I'm developing something for, a, a, a number of the machines, and I work out how, how bad the power supply is, how much ground bounce there is. And that can be very variable, but on some machines it's consistently terrible. And so then I have to do um, power conditioning, not just for my addition, but that also affects the, the, the power on the whole board. And it has impacts back into the machine, into the vintage hardware. And so we're actually developing hardware that can keep the old hardware running a bit longer before it needs recapping. And so we're actually helping you mask problems with your hardware. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions on what we've talked about so far? No? Okay. So, well, I would say that about the sound thing. So one of the things I did at Tandy, I designed all their sound cards and all their modems. Mm -hmm. And the answer there is sub-regulation. Okay, a good assumption, and anybody here into Euro rack modular synthesizers or a... Really? I have an MG1. They're just two people? Okay. When you say, say Euro rack is a synthesizer standard, okay, that is known for having power supplies, which are basically filtered pink noise, okay? <laughs> because they try to make it as cheap as possible. So when I was doing those designs, plus I learned it from my Tandy sound card days. In fact, my co-designer for that, Steve Erickson, he became the VP of Creative Labs. <laughs> he did not me. Anyway, <laughs> he's on the yacht now. Paul's stealing the show, everyone. I'm not stunned about that at all. I'm not bitter. <laughs> but the answer is, even our even the Tandy stuff, where it was captive, in other words, you think that Tandy can c control their own things to a degree, which we could, but we found out that we just had to sub-regulate everything. Now, we were Motorola's largest you know, customer in the world, so we could get regulators for like they would pay us a dollar just to stick it on the board, okay? But even today, I found out the best way to do anything hooked to old equipment or especially noisiest power supplies, is you never use their power, ever. You always, even if you have to subregulate down and then buck it back up, which seems weird, okay? Like go from 12 to 5, 5 back up to 12. The thing is nowadays, the switchers, which used to be horrible, are now lower noise than linear. I'll say that again. Switchers today, you can buy them, not mean well. Don't buy Meanwell. But you can buy switchers that are lower noise than linear 7805s. Okay, everybody's like, I like 7805s, okay? Radio Shack had them. And I'm like, that thing is a noise generator. Okay, 7805. And, and it wastes power, too. Yeah, and it's a right, hazard. and it's a power hog. So take your time and don't, and the last thing I want to talk about is this, is because I see this a lot in retro, especially on Tendi, is people who cut and paste designs, assuming that if I saw it on the internet and he had a board for sale, it must be a good board so I can take his design and put it on my board. Because why would he have it on the internet if it wasn't a good board? <laughs> and the answer is, he got his to work. Okay, the first Z80 single board computer I bought, that is a doornail, all right? And I just kind of blindly built it, thinking it was gonna work. 
until I said, why is this Enmos C80 trying to drive 42 TTL loads on this board without any <laughs> bus buffering? The Model 1 had bus buffering. What is it? And then I started looking at all these SBCs. I haven't found a single one that had a bus buffer on it because that's a case of it works great for me, okay? It works great for me. So if you're designing stuff to interface and you get yours to work, don't immediately think that you can launch a website, okay? You gotta get a hundred to work and then go launch your website. I, I have a recommendation for anyone who aspires to design retro products, you know, if they if they don't have, say, an education in electronics or engineering, go out and get yourself just a basic book on electronics that teaches you Ohm's Law, just f to begin with, and some basic logic. Learn the basics, and then from that point, you'll learn why things are connected they, the way they are and why certain parts are used the way they are, and you'll end up with a much more robust product if that's what you want to do. Uh, many people see that it's very simple to take a schematic that's on the internet, maybe even a KiCad schematic, and then just load it up, do a quick uh, route on the board and go get boards made. And, and even if the design is perfect, if you do that, you'll end up with a board that may not be reliable. It may be marginal. And so you'll get the board back, and you've done everything exactly the way it needed to be done, but you've got all this noise, you've got crosstalk, it, it resets, it reboots, it locks up, and you just don't know what it is. And it's because some of these things that you learn in electronics and in engineering really are required to understand how to design and build things that are reliable and that will work. And the only so, way you can do that is to fail many, many times. Exactly. Yeah. And, I, and I'll run boards, you know, because like you said, they're fairly cheap. I'll just, you know, put something together that I think is more or less going to work. I'll run five of them, build one, spend some time testing it, realize, yep, that didn't work, that didn't work, moving around, run another one, run another one. Mm -hmm. uh, I ran probably six different commanders before we got there. So, it so just to let you know, when we were running these BlackBerry circuit boards, they're 28 layer with 150 micron traces, laser drilled, 0.1 millimeter vias, and we would go through around 75 board revisions for every phone. Let that sink in. 75 board revisions between prototype and production. And in most times we were running 11 revisions in parallel through the factory because the antenna guy wanted something. I'm the audio guy. I wanted the audio stuff. The processor guy says, I kind of want it to boot, okay? <laughs> and so don't think that you have to get it right, everything perfect on the first rev, okay? Even the most simple things, okay? I've put a connector on a board and messed it up. All right, that's because I kind of mentally know now. Four board, you know, five boards, JLC, four day delivery, twenty two dollars. <laughs> okay, my wife is like, here's Amazon, here's Mouser, here's JLC, mm -hmm. because you don't have to get it right the first time. Yeah. In fact, if you get it right, okay, there's an old saying: if you're the smartest guy in the room, change rooms. If you think your first board is ready for production because it seemed to work, you're wrong. Let somebody else look at it. Never grade your own English paper. Let somebody else look at it. Okay? Because it's very rare to get it right the first time. Yeah, it's definitely important to have testers and collaborators, especially if you're looking to sell the product commercially because you don't want to send 40, 50 out and then realize some huge mistake happened and now you're left with a problem to send 40 or 50 more out and it's very expensive to make those kinds of mistakes so it's definitely worth it and that's why a lot of times people will ask me when's your midi card when's, when's your midi card coming out and i'm like when it's done you know <laughs> and right at the moment had a little issue so we had to try something else and you know that's just how it goes unfortunately but it's it's actually yeah even you know I, i've never run anything you know commercially back in the day like you guys had but even in like 2008 2009 when pcbs first started coming you know available 
they were still relatively expensive. It would be a hundred bucks, maybe yeah. 150 100. bucks to run a few boards. And as a not very, you know, established hobbyist, it, even that just felt too expensive, but that's kind of how I started doing it. I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, I realized it's kind of cheaper now. It's, you know, and even now it's gone down further. And so, yeah, like you said, I get boards in four or five days pretty often. Unless there's a holiday in China, and then you're at the whim of that. So <laughs> that was last week. Yeah, last week. Last week. We have on our Chinese help. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's it's definitely you know, KiCads are pretty easy to use now. It, it you know, there's tons of tutorials out there. You know, just make an LED flash and give it a try if you if you're interested in doing it because there's actually quite a bit of information out there now, and it's it's easier than it's ever been to design boards. But, and I'm sure I may get some disagreement with this because I'm not a a real engineer. I uh, just play one on TV, but the um, I've been working in some capacity, you know, my entire career like that, but uh, not, you know, officially certified. But I think like a lot of people in the room here, I'm sure a lot of you guys have been messing around for 40 or 50 years. And, you know, it took me a while before I even felt comfortable making the plunge, even though I was taking everything in the house apart as a child, you know, when I was six and seven years old. And, um, you know, now here we are. So it's definitely out there and definitely a lot easier to approach than it's ever been, uh, for sure. So that's one thing that um, leads into the second half of the talk, which is the tools are free. The tools are easy to download, easy to use, and ordering PCBs from the beginning stage to ordering and receiving a PCB costs less than a meal out. And that creates a very, very low barrier to entry. Now, I don't need to get me wrong, I'm not telling anyone to not design PCBs, and I'm not ragging on anyone who does and fails, um, but it's really important to know how to use the tools and to know why things are a certain way. And knowing why things are a certain way is half the battle. Sometimes you can look at PCB and it's like, why is this all the way over here? Why, why is, what is this? And, and, but when you understand the circuit, it evolved to that place to fix problems. As, as you know, things end up on the 75th revision looking completely different to the first revision. And a, a circuit can tell you that it wants to be a certain way to work well. Yeah, I think that um, a common mistake is, and, and probably all of us are guilty of this when we started doing PC board layout, is you think of it like you would put it on a perf board or a wireless breadboard. You kind of map the schematic down onto the board you're building. So you can look at the schematic and you put the resistors kind of the same place they are and you kind of follow along. And that will generally work to prove the circuit functions. But I'm a big proponent of a difference between a design and a product. Okay, Designs are fairly easy to do. If you want about 90% of stuff that works, buy a Forrest Mims book and look in there from Radio Shack. And you can, you know, get stuff working. But I don't know if I would take that and make it into a product. All right. But it's good to learn to do that. Now, how I was going to bring this up because I think this is also something I hear that's still about retro. Because when people think about old computers and stuff, everything is through hole. So don't be shy. How many people here still won't do SMT because they're just not comfortable with SMT? Okay. I have two words for you. Amazon microscopes. Okay. I, I have fairly poor vision, and I stayed away from SMT as a hobbyist as long as I possibly could on my synthesizer stuff until you reach a point where you can't get ARM processors and dip. Okay. So I had to use SMT. So you start off with like giant resistors and giant capacitors and stuff, but then you find out those cost more or they can't get it. Go to Amazon. They have their own brand called AmScope, A-M Scope. It will be the best money you've ever spent. You buy one of those AmScope. Now, they're stereo, but I'm only good in one eye, so I'm like a pirate looking through it, okay? <laughs> but I can hand drag solder 
you know, 144 TQFPs like there's no tomorrow. Absolutely perfect. Or for $7 more, you can buy a stencil when you order your board. Yeah, and put it in the little oven. Yeah. yeah. It's way, well, you have way to be easy. good enough to actually scrape it on there. And, okay, I'm a, I'm outlawed with power tools in 17 <laughs> states. Okay, I'm not very good <laughs> mechanically use a card. like Just holding cheap. the stencil and putting the paste on it and scraping it and trying not to eat it because it looks tasty. <laughs> so I still solder. <laughs> But I'm saying is, if you think that the soldering is preventing you, okay, that's the main thing is, I don't see how it's possible to solder. I'm saying, if you buy one of these AM scopes, they're a couple of hundred dollars, and you look through it for the first time, it looks like you're trying to solder on the battleship Enterprise or something. <laughs> the, the, I mean, even your tip looks big, the solder's big, and you'll find out, for people who do it, it's faster than through hole will ever be because there's no flip and clip and buying these big holders from Switzerland and you flip it over and half the parts fall out and, and you're cutting it and it goes in your foot and okay, who's got a 555 in their ankle? Anybody? Yeah, stepping on it. Surface mount, you don't do that. And after a while, you realize just how fast and easy it really is. It really is easy. Once, once you get past about five boards, um, when you when you release a project and you're making them in small batches at first, once you get past about five boards, it makes sense to go SMD. It really does. Um, so much so that I spent thousands of dollars on a pick and place machine because my eyes are also not that great, and my bank account's not that great. <laughs> Nor is mine now. Um, but I know, know where I was you just live. Say, since we were talking about it, you know the commander. But I was going to say there is a wonderful bag here yeah. that is a lesson, an object lesson. This is a uh, five-layer board, as it turns out, and uh, I'll show you guys. Five layer. That's yeah. odd. So it's a standard four-layer board on you know the back, but on the front, there's a nice fifth layer that uh, was added in manufacturing that uh, <laughs> fell in the wave solder. Yeah. Now obviously this was not intentional, but uh, he didn't you know. clamp it good in the wave solder machine. Is what happened. Yeah, they said this has never happened before, but it happened eight times to us. So uh, I'm not sure there, why. There may be a slight <laughs> short on the board, just a yeah. small. They they put a tag on it, so we know there's a problem. So. But yeah, but this board I was just going to say was it was through hole purely for aesthetics, and it actually turned into a, a huge difficulty to get these made because getting you know traditional wave soldering done now is not really as common as you would think. I mean, they still use it a lot for power supplies and other things, but yeah, that getting it outsourced is a much more difficult process than doing SMD soldering. So for mass production, definitely surface mount also is very, very simple. It's way easier to automate. On that board, the uh, the sockets are placed by hand? Yeah, they, they actually place this whole thing by hand. And these boards are actually quite expensive to have manufactured. The, the uh, manpower costs on that, I can't even imagine. It's I don't know how they made money, to be honest. Yeah. It's how many people they had working on these and as long as it took them. Uh, and it was not trivial. It, it cost nearly as much, if not as more than the parts, just for the yeah. assembly. Um, so that's just a... Yeah, there used to be only one place in all of Dallas-Fort Worth that had a dip inserter. It was a company called Universal yes. that made a dip inserter. And once you got a price quote and ran boards through the dip inserter, you didn't do that anymore. I mean, it's just Yeah, we'd have to buy the parts expensive. and reels and... Yeah, I work. I worked in in a company that built mini computers, and we had our own universal line of dip insertion, and uh, we produced. We did mass production. Mass production was a hundred boards uh, on the uh, on the dip packages, and uh, every one of the steps that you have to go through is important because for the ICs, when they put them on the board, um, they cinch the pins underneath so that they don't fall out. Uh, they, the components that are discrete, what they do is they preload a reel. They pick all the components in sequence and put all them on a reel so that they can be put in and again cinched on the bottom. And then when they put them through the wave, they, they, they preheat the boards for a period of time to bring them up to temperature. They run them over a bath of, of uh, flux and then they run them over this wave and at the end they go into a washer to clean out. And so from from the start of the machine to where the board comes out the other end, 
there was no people touching the board. They were all automated. And it took a lot of equipment to do that, uh, to get the reliability up, because on a mini computer, you couldn't afford to have bent under pins or, or bad solder joints, things of that nature. Well, and also we had briefly toyed with the idea of just building these ourselves because we do build a lot of things. But, I mean, it was eight, nine hours it took for me and my wife, who are pretty experienced at soldering now, to just build one of these things. And it became pretty apparent that that wasn't going to work. And then we talked about bringing other people in. But, you know, getting the quality of the soldering when you bring a hundred random people in is certainly questionable. So at the end of the day, sometimes you have to cut bait and get them manufactured. But, you know, just to kind of circle back to the point, SMD, if you can deal with it, and it's not that hard, I swear. Uh, I was very afraid of it myself, too. And then the first time we started making a few boards, I was like, why in the world didn't we do this before? And it's <laughs> immediately you're like, oh, my God. And you can build things 100 times faster, especially it's, when you're it, building yeah, yourself. Seems, which, yeah, it seems counterintuitive that it's faster. Yeah. Because if you're like me, okay, you're picking up the part and trying to stick it on the microscope like 20 times, and it falls on the floor, and you're doing this and stuff like that. But it's like muscle memory. But that only happens with the first couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a Says ton Mr. of 0603 and 0402 is embedded in my carpet. There's no question <laughs> yeah. about that. But, All but around. You'd be surprised if you get, it takes good tweezers. You wind up getting different things. You don't need to have dikes that can cut through coat hangers anymore. What you do, what you spend your money on are really good tweezers. Precision. Okay. And quality solder paste. Right. Really good T5 tweezers. solder paste. And yeah. you can sit there and pick and up those iron. parts and just stick them on the board like there's no tomorrow. He mentioned about solder paste. So you can get stencils from JLC and PCBY and places like that, which is stainless steel laser cut that you can buy solder paste, which is looks like toothpaste. It kind of feels like toothpaste. It's tacky. Doesn't taste like toothpaste. No. I've already tried. <laughs> It's not Nutella, okay? It's solder paste. And you squeegee it on, basically with a credit card. They give you a little credit card to squeegee it on. And then you can put the parts down on it and heat them up either with a hot air gun or what mm -hmm. I did was there's a kit that takes a Black & Decker toaster oven and turns it into a PID controller that ramps. Cause I still use surface, two of those for production. Yeah, because one so of the things solder paste is designed to, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. when you do production soldering, you preheat, it's called soaking, you, you soak the board, you hold it at temperature, and then you cool the board off. When you hand solder, okay, you take your Hako iron you bought, and who knows what the temperature is, and you cram it on this thing from room temperature to, you know, 800 yeah. degrees or whatever you have it set on, and most parts aren't ever designed to do that, really. Okay, that's not how they're made they think that you're going to put them on this nice gentle heating curve okay and so it's actually hard to hand solder teeny tiny surface mount but the good news is you can get a hot air gun and you have to have the little wrist action going and when you actually heat the solder balls and it melts even if your part is on crooked and it's until you see it to believe it you'll have a chip with 100 pins that's off at like a 10 degree angle and when it heats it goes like this boink mm -hmm. because the surface tension is pulling the part and you think how and then the just surface, go watch lewis rossman on how to get rid of the it bridges just goes, <laughs> yeah. it just rotates and goes <laughs> so we're in the last couple of minutes now um do we have any questions from anyone no I think we're scaring everyone. I mean, it is fair to mention, you know, yeah. you know, on your point there, there are some parts which do require to be baked because yeah. they will shrink and it causes the pores and the chips to shrink up. If you don't do that, then they will actually start to absorb moisture down the road and they can fail. Uh, some guy told me he puts fingernail polish on them and that does it, so he claims, but I recommend baking I them do that. using a hot air gun. <laughs> in, in the real world, we used to put them in an oven to bake 24 yeah. hours before yes. production uh, because it is a serious problem. They, they turn into popcorn if... If you've seen popcorn pop, that's what happens to chips if they have moisture. In, in, in Texas, with the humidity, the okay. components absorb the moisture, and then it turns to steam so quickly it can't vent. Yeah. And but also, it's fair to mention, like the uh, Western Design Center 6502 processors I buy all come labeled that they must be baked. And I actually know the guys from Western Design. We talked many a time. And I asked them flat out, I'm like, 
are these supposed to be baked? And he's like, no. So Mauser mismarks things often <laughs> that they just assume for some reason. Okay, you have Did to you understand that, that when you buy stuff like at Mauser and you get 75 boxes full of, you know, little bags and stuff, when you get your ICs, they tend to be vacuum sealed, right? Especially large pen count ICs. Resist temptation to open just to look at it to see if it's, you know, the right part. Yeah. Trust them because once you cut the moisture barrier and you're supposed to the air, you're supposed to solder them within 24 hours. They okay. come with a little card that's blue and pink. So depending on the color, that's how much moisture. So you have, have we scared everybody from surface mount again? Are you like, well, I'm not never going to do that ever in my life? I, I've seen some dips with that restriction. I would definitely get an oven. They're cheap enough. I mean, I don't trust the hot plates to actually get the temperature, okay. you know. Just the like oven heats so. from both. The oven I mean, it probably would sides, work in a, for one-off so, things. Yeah. The hot plate is, I'll tell you what, the hot plate is good for QFNs. If you know what that is, it's a kind of package where the leads are basically under the part, and it's a ceramic part usually. So you can cook it like Mrs. Fields' cookie, and it won't, you know, get all upset too much because it's ceramic. But... Hot plate, I think, is something that should not be done when there's other much easier ways to do it better. My experience with hot plates is that people tend to use them already at the temperature and they'll drop a small board on and the board will heat very quickly and the components will go through a thermal shock and then it will cool down too quickly when you take it off. And with a with an oven, at least you're running a, a profile that will allow it to heat soak correctly and allow all of the components to get just below the reflow temperature. And the the failure rate that you get on a run of boards is much lower with an oven. So I, I'd like to point something out, and, and we haven't really touched on this, is in terms of the people that build boards and product, do, do you use any special test equipment at all? after you build your products, like analyzers, oscilloscopes, things of that nature? Ooh, no. Okay. Uh, it's important to understand analyzers and oscilloscopes and how you can apply them to look at your designs and make sure that the design is robust. Being able to go in and probe signals and make sure that the signal quality is there is so very important. There's a whole, there are people that all they do is signal integrity. Right. They don't design product. They don't program product. All they do is they look at signals and they tell you whether those signals are within specification. And the problem is, just as was mentioned earlier, is if you don't have buffering on your board and you're driving 40 chips, right, by the time the signal gets to the last chip, the noise margin which is the the difference between you know how sensitive the signal is is being detected versus how it was transmitted is very small and so noise will trigger the circuit so it's very important to understand that if you're sending a signal from one chip to another that when it arrives at the other chip that it is at the right signaling level so that it's acceptable and it's guaranteed over time and temperature and and frequency so those things are what make you a, a better designer and make a better product if you're going to be building hundreds or thousands of boards if you don't do that you might build 10 or 15 and they work great and you ramp up to 50 or a hundred or a thousand and all of a sudden you're getting 20 30 percent of your boards don't work mm -hmm. and you don't know why one of my related takeaways is don't use a logic analyzer exclusively. It gives you a false impression. If you look closely enough, every digital signal is an analog signal. You need to look at it in an analog domain using an oscilloscope. And that is critical to understanding what's going on in your board. I want to give another piece of advice that my dad used to tell me when he used to, he used to do arts and crafts and wholesaler, and he made his own catalog. And this is something I tell people, and it, it's kind of tried, but it's true. Ink is free. So what do I mean by ink is free? Put everything on your silk screen. Okay. It doesn't cost you anything. Now back in the old days, they would Why say, Why didn't you How? guys do that back in the old days? Well, back actually, in the old days, they would, you know, oh, you well, they would say stuff like, 
IRQ3. And you went, great. Well, every board has IRQ3 on it. Okay. Why don't you have a little chart on there? You have room right there. Why don't you just put a chart on it? And so I encourage everybody to think about it. Okay. Doing retro stuff. My most agonizing thing when I'm trying to look at an old schematic is they'll have a connector on the schematic that says J11, right? J11. What the heck is J11? Oh, it's this AMP 493-11. Well, where's that? It's in the bill of material. Well, where's the bill of material? We don't know. All we have is the schematic. <laughs> well, if you put it on the schematic, I wouldn't need the bill of material. That's not how we do things. We put a schematic, and we have a bill of material, and then the PC board guy says, we have an assembly drawing. So okay. when you do a design, please put everything on the schematic because ink is free. Okay, are we, are we at time? 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes. Anyone got any questions in the last 10 minutes? Come on. No? Come on. Someone, please, question. Just go, go to the microphone and... Hey, I just want to, um, on the last thing you're talking about, the analysis after it's built or whatever, um, my my background is at, at Compaq HP for quite a while. So obviously they're building much more elaborate circuits than most folks in here would be building. So um, just one thing that was a lot of gotchas that happened a lot was, was timing. And you kind of touched on some of the analysis, but if you just go and look at, like when you're building a thing, whatever the most critical timing um, pathway is going to be and look how close it is on that board you built it it works great but how close is that one because your next batch of parts may shift you might even need to substitute a technology back and forth and so that was something that you know back in the early 90s that like we used to get into that yeah. a lot you i mean the commander issues with one type you had to get a slightly different technology yes. and the timing screwed I wound up switching from HCT to ACT chips at one point, even though on paper the HCT chips should have been fast enough. Yeah. Uh, the reality is they weren't, yeah. and there were just things we were running into. And, and I'm sure you're aware too. And, and, and that's another thing. You know, there's a. I know it sounds scary, and I kind of realized during this conversation that we're probably frightening anyone who wants to get into this. But you have to kind of tread slowly. You know, don't go yeah. get an ARM CPU and try to hook well, it up like and if you're, drive if a you're nuclear reactor day one. Few, you know, if, yeah. you, if you're really thinking about, hey, I want to sell a thousand of these. Then, then take that step sure. and go and look at that. Yeah, I, yeah. and so, I mean, my my thought on that is that you really, you know, start slow, move into more advanced things, and as you start, you know, realizing, hey, I need to do this now, you'll start reading into it a little bit more, and then the next thing you know, six, seven years have passed, and you're like, hey, I kind of actually know what I'm doing now, and that's kind Never of use, okay, for people who, like, when you do time and you want to look at the data sheets and calculate your worst-case timing, just pretend the typical column doesn't exist, Typical in a data sheet, and I know because I worked at Microchip for five years writing PIC 24 data sheets. Don't blame me. I just wrote the data sheet. <laughs> Is that we put typical in there because our customers kind of want to see it. And what typical means is we got a co-op to measure one chip in the lab on a Friday. And whatever he came up with, we went, stick it in the data sheet and tell your mama you're a published author. <laughs> <laughs> so always think of the worst case timing. Because as a, one of my mentors said when I was in telecom industry, if it can't work on paper, why does it going to work in the circuit? True, true, true. I, I used to count I used to count nanoseconds throughout my designs. My, my first design was 600 ICs, and in order to ensure that I was ready to produce that, ready ready to produce that design, I went through that whole design, counting the worst case timings through each chip, to ensure that if I had five signals coming into a chip and it provided a certain amount of of timing margin that my delays didn't add up and eat that margin up right so uh it's very important to understand these things that's why i i began with get a book on basic electronics and start learning those details because eventually you'll learn that you have to understand about 
propagation delay, rise and fall times of signals, and and set up and hold times. These are all important things that are that need to be understood so that when you design a product, it works. And you can do all that on paper. You don't need a CAD tool. You don't need anything special. You can hand draw it and you can go to the data sheet and put the numbers in and just count them. And if it meets your timing, then you're good. And then you can put it into your CAD system. In my case, um, the way it really shows up is in component choices to make the address decoding logic as shallow as possible. So I'm going through a few layers of 7.4 series logic to arrive at a chip select because that time can really build up, you know, 7.5 nanoseconds plus 7.9 plus 7.9. You know, and what, and what you're talking about there makes me think of, you know, the commander. I know why most uh, PCs back in the day didn't run at more than 4 megahertz. It had everything to do with LS logic, the speed at which you could decode things. And that's why we're moving into ACT logic, which wasn't even really that readily available back in. But it's also fair to mention that this is where you start moving into CPLDs and FPGAs mm -hmm. because you now have too many hops to go through for decoding and you just simply can't meet the timing. And if you want to start running at higher megahertz, you know, and, and from a 6502 standpoint, 16 would be incredibly difficult, I think, to pull off. I don't know that anyone's yeah. ever done it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a an old digital uh, music keyboard, one of the first digital keyboards ever designed called the Synergy. And I'm putting it into, an, into a Lattice FPGA. But I'm going through the timing because there's no theory of operation. It was all like a secret. And so I'm going through the schematic and I'm adding up the timing and I get to the end and there's no margin. You ran out. Mm -hmm. And so the designer who's even older than me, who's still alive, I called him up and I said, hey, I'm looking through your state machine decoding here for your microcode and you're out of time margin. He goes, well, we just swapped chips out till it worked. <laughs> Ship it. And, okay, this guy has a PhD from MIT. He was a Bell Labs researcher for 37 years. And I said, no, no, don't mess with me. I mean, he goes, oh, no, no, we would just sit there and we had a technician and this was 74s logic would swap them out and when the, when it when the light started blinking at the end ship it <laughs> okay we have time for one one or two more questions real quick i've got a, a quick question most of us are kind of familiar with a lot of these older chips that were built like in the 70s and the 80s and we know that a lot of them aren't available anymore you can't just go on to mauser or digikey and get some of these chips that are available especially the custom chips for like you know the commodore 64 and that sort of thing and I know that, um, in fact, I've, I've seen Adrian order some stuff like out of China. And on occasion, I see him use a, a cotton swab and try and see if he can take the, the, the paint off the top of it as a way to detect if it's a counterfeit chip. And I was wondering, is, is there any kind of reliable way to discover if a chip is counterfeit? Is it uh, just plug it in and see if it works? Plug it in and watch the heat. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there's a thing called a FLIR, F-L-I-R, forward-looking infrared. Get a little FLIR thing for your camera they're about two hundred dollars they're accurate to a tenth of a degree c they're very good to maps color to temperature and you can sit there and hold that flare on there and watch watch the heat stuff go whatever you do do not buy from a company called ut source yes. avoid ut source if you buy from ut source you will be burned you will be burned yeah okay. you will be and burned. they're a big company too they look very legitimate it's kind of deceptive and i know I mean, like Tube Time, if you guys know who he is, buys parts from them. He's like, oh, I have great luck with them. I'm like, dude, <laughs> Here's no. Yeah, if it's I a, bought so much garbage there. I, I if, gave up. And the problem if, is, if is if they started well. A, yeah, if yeah. you're trying to find old retro digital parts, learn Verilog and do it in a Lattice FPGA. They're $4.00. 5,000 lookup tables, which is equivalent to about 30,000 gates of TTL for $4. Internal gate delay, 120 picoseconds. I have a Z80 system running CPM on it at 80 megahertz. And that's why the Vera is so fast. Same chip. Okay. I know you have to do some work, but it's really not that hard. Okay. If you can program in BASIC, you can learn Verilog. <laughs> And the tools are free, free tools. That's how you get around it, okay? You can say, I never, I'll never, i never figure out what's in there or whatever. My, my answer is, the guy who did it figured it out. So you can too. 
you'd be surprised what you can figure out. I was just going to say, you know, a lot of people think it takes the fun out of retro to use FPGAs and CPLDs. And, you know, I sort of thought that at first as well. But when you really start understanding what they're doing, they're just functionally equivalent. It's just the same thing. So it's. So, June, you are bursting with. No? No. Okay. Um, anyone else have a question? Just one quick one. Uh, I remember seeing, I'm pretty sure, a video online where you were uh, looking at wave soldering all of the commander uh, x16 motherboards in-house and there were disasters with warps war warping boards yes. warping and things like that did that ever get resolved well that's this board is not the result of that just for the record this is actually a board that we had commercially manufactured so that was how we resolved it uh, essentially you know as <laughs> as we uh, you know trying to preheat a board like this and then get it into the, the dip quickly enough, it was incredibly difficult, and I had a lot of trouble. By the way, you know, just to butt in here, we all think about doing that in something called wave soldering, which is literally a rotating vat of liquid solder, okay? You just want to walk up and stick your hand in it. But I work for a company called Vario, and what we did for that is called selective solder. You actually have a solder pump that goes on the bottom of the board one at a time and touches every single pin with the solder pump. It works great, and you won't have any of those problems. And you think, well, how fast can that be? We have to sit there and do this. And I said, well, you don't have to roll it up at the Hollis machine and preheat it. You stick it in the fixture. You already know the XY coordinates because it's from your CAD program, and this little thing basically is a it's like a chocolate fountain at the banquet but instead of pumping chocolate for your strawberries it's, like it's pumping liquid solder through a little nozzle and it basically just goes okay yeah. and you get perfect solder every time without going over a wave and worrying about preheating board area and things like that it's called okay. selective solder we are at time that's uh, it's been wonderful talking with you and sharing some of our experiences as hardware developers and uh, trying to earn a bit of sympathy, maybe. Yeah.